If I don't do it, I scare people. So I got to put the message with a warning because God's doing amazing things lately. Every so often I get loud. And sometimes I just burst out and, and throw some things out in the spirit. So get, And you say, well, that's out of order. It's not order because I told you that we're going to do that. It's very in order. We are about all about order. So we want to warn you that I have no idea. Sometimes when God says, go like this, lately there's anointing to throw stuff. Are you ready to catch stuff? Yeah. There's an, lately there's been anointing that I feel already coming. And I'm going to give you an example of what it does. But there is anointing for this. And you know what? At first my mind says be embarrassed, but I can't be. You go, oh! You know, it just, it just releases. <laughs> I was throwing it to her because I knew she would take <laughs> And literally, there is a source. The first time it happened to me was on a spiritual DNA course. Um, I was feeling this for a whole week, but I was scared to use it. And when it was happening, I got so drained, I didn't know how to use this power. <laughs> and I was trying to preach, but I was so drained out. So I'm learning how to use this new power that God has given, and it's implanted, and He's being released. And you know what? If you don't receive nothing spiritually, at least it will wake you up to hear the Word, right? Let's take it positive either way. And we don't judge it, and let's just go for it. So I'm warning you ahead of time, every so often, God just says this. So another thing is that we, we start doing here is we start talking. Meaning that when I talk, we need some amens once in a while. You know why we need amens? Because it's not religion, it's agreement. And agreement, every time you say amen, it strengthens this place by 10,000 times. And so when we do this, is that I can preach better, and God can use us better, because we're in agreement, right? We walk in that place of of being very successful with this, okay? Because what we do is that every time you say yes or amen or even nod your head, this word becomes 10,000 times stronger that God is releasing for you today. What happens if everyone here, and I did a calculation just not that long ago, for 32 people, if we all say yes and amen and have an agreement, that's about that we can flee 160,000. That is huge, right? That's enough to flee the whole town of Morris. We're not talking about people, we're talking about spirits. But either way, it's to, you know... Just be, be aware of that, that, that you need to get excited with me because I'm, I can't be a preacher by myself. I have to have an audience that actually pulls. And when we do this, we can see great things that Jesus Christ is doing. Was there another person that had a prayer for this? Hmm? Bern? Yeah, Bern. There was one more person that had it? Yeah, let's not t- take that word away. When God does that, I was feeling that when I was in the office, I said, God, this is not mine because I don't... Up here, never. And... Um, Later. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's here for now. So let's really get rid of, um, rid of this um, pain here. And this guy's going to go on YouTube, so we're going to see a miracle happening here. In Jesus' name. Um, everybody believe for a miracle because we need agreement. So just everybody say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Have, your way. have your way. Thank God, Thank God. Your, way your way is healing. Yeah, in Jesus' name, I release that right now by the power of the blood of Jesus. We cancel that out in the name of Jesus Christ. By the word of knowledge that came, we say no to the who, and we say healing flow in Jesus. Jesus. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes. One thing cool you have to understand: there's going to be word of knowledge is probably coming out today. I'm very excited, by the way. Amen. Yeah. And what does the word of knowledge do? What the word of knowledge does is this. It's, it's because it's a part of God's word, part of his promise. It's a, from the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural gift of word and knowledge, stuff that I can't find out besides God can tell me, and so forth. So what happens when God says that I want to heal this today? There's no condition no more. There's no condition no more because he said so. Well, the only condition is that you make your own condition. So don't make your own condition because if he says so, he says so. So when there is a supernatural, like even when she comes and prophesies, when we prophesy, when that word of knowledge says, there's somebody that has this pain and God wants to get rid of it today, say, okay, instead of trying to reason away, because the only thing that's stopping is your reasoning. Because I heard this from a different minister and I, I studied it myself, and when that comes directly from God, it's because He directly wants to show off today. So expect some word of knowledge because we're going to see some miracles that way. Expect some words that God will just show up and say, I want to deal with that, I want to deal with this today. But first of all, we've got to romance with the, Holy, um, with the wisdom a little bit. Let's do, do some romancing. How many of you like romance? <laughs> yeah, we all do. We might not all want to admit it, but we all love romancing. And you think I have nobody romance? Oh, you still like romancing. Men that say they don't like chick flicks, they sometimes don't mean it, what they're saying. 
because <laughs> they actually probably do like it a lot in some ways. Yeah, with the right people around, of course. <laughs> okay, you got to give me a minute here. I'm just going to shut that and open it up again. There we go. You know how things work. It's technology. I just got to fuzz through my paper here. There we go. Romancing wisdom. I, 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 I was kind of hard time uh, calling it that, but that's what the Lord showed me the first time. Then I was going to say embracing wisdom, but, but romancing, like, wow, romancing. And, you know, it's just because when we talk about it, we're going to read out of um, Proverbs 4 or 5 to 13, it prefers it as a she. It prefers it as a her. Like, how many like intimacy with Jesus? Well, this is the same idea. This is something that we have to take really seriously into our hearts and see the power of God released in us like never before. If we have wisdom, we're going to see more healing. If we have, we have this very source of, of romance, this very force of embracing with this, we're going to see more things we ever have because we're going to follow the right direction. So how many of you want to follow the right direction? So open your hearts with expectation. And I'm talking to you. Amen? And when we're talking to you, it's just that we want you to receive. Uh, we need to get everybody out of the little cuddle they're in or that little hole they're in. And everybody needs to get brave and, get, and peek out for today and say, I'm here to help. And when we do that, it's you, every time you say amen, you release what God is within you into this crowd. And when you release it with the, what God is with you in this crowd, now you're all part of this ministry that's happening. I'm just a leader now. And when we walk in this power, and it flows through this leader. And what happens with the power of the Holy Spirit, because in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down, it came as a cloven tongue. And when that word cloven tongue means a part of the Holy Spirit was set on each person, which was about 120 people at that time, and that was set on there. What happens in a crowd like this, in a church like this, is when we all say amen, the Holy Spirit comes and becomes one force. And when that one force comes, we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, because I only have part, you only have part, but when we work together, we have the whole thing. So that's why we need that. And that's why we need to get excited about our amens sometimes, or yeses, or nods, or whatever we do, but we come in an agreement. And when we come in agreement, we see the power of agreement. And some people say, well, that might be religious. Well, don't, don't let it become religious. Just don't let it become to that point. Like, I've been in churches where that becomes a religious force. Everybody raise their hand every five minutes, or every this, or every that. And I realize that it becomes very daunting, if you want to call it the right word. I'm not even sure if that's the right word. But it just becomes a place where, again? <laughs> no, again? <sighs> or you say again, or I say again. You have to choose to... I don't want you to always repeat me. I want you to come in agreement with me. And so when we come in agreement, that's where the strength is. So that's way beyond my message, but it's part, part of being wisdom. See, the thing is, that actually goes well with my message because I think we became wise with it. I think we became, God showed us wisdom. And ever since I've been starting to talk to people and they've been saying, amen, yes, we've seen greater miracles and we've seen greater power of release. It's because now it's about the church being together. It's about us working together. And Proverbs 4, verse 5 says this. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of your mouth. So first of all, get wisdom. What does wisdom mean? Wisdom is God's skill. Actually, as a skill, being a skillful warrior in God's kingdom. That's what wisdom is. You get wisdom. Get skill. So don't just go out there and try to be a warrior that you're not. Get the skill, then be the warrior that you are. And so when you walk in the wisdom, we are warring in skill. And so we need to get wisdom. See, the thing is, what I see in Christianity, some of us don't have wisdom. We try to fight, and then we just don't win. We need to get skill. And that's what wisdom means, get skill. And it also means um, being, being very solid. It also means to, um, in religious affairs, to be really strengthened in that, to be religious affairs. I don't know if you, how many of you like being religious. I, I learned that religion is not a bad thing. Pure religion. Jesus talked about pure religion. We need to get back to pure religion. And so whenever I study the Bible, I always look at these words and it always talks about religious. And in a good way. And when I study these words, I say, wow, our culture really has brought that word religion to nothing. And so the word religion is, is totally terrible if it's religiosity. And the word, the word religion, do you know what the word religion actually means? It actually means pure worship. It means the worship in what you believe in. So religiosity, and when we say somebody's religious, they're worshiping something that's not of God or not of Jesus Christ. They worship man-made stuff, right? And so when we look at religion, that's what we prefer religion to. We prefer religion to this church because they're not in the Holy Ghost or they're, they're not doing this. We prefer that as religiosity, right? 
But when Jesus talks about, when the scripture talks about pure religion, it means that we purely walk after Jesus. We purely worship him. We, we, good old time religion. Good old time religion as Jesus Christ. Power of the Holy Ghost, anointings flowing in it. So when I'm talking to religious, it actually means in a religious, it's becoming wisdom and religious. Re- being wisdom in every action we take in our worship. Take wisdom in well, how we pray for people. Take wisdom in how we do church. That's what it's talking about. And it's just in that place of uh, being ethnical and religious. That's what it says. Wisdom. Wisdom is a place of purity that brings us into the right religion. Because we walk in religion, we don't, when we walk in wisdom, we don't walk in religiosity anymore, but we walk in purity now. We walk in Christ Jesus. So then verse 6 says, forsake her not. Her. Ooh. We're talking, let's get romantic now. I love romance. It's one of my favorite subjects. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve you. That word preserve means guard you. Love her. Talking about wisdom, love her. It's getting really nasty now, to romance here. Love her, and, you, and she shall keep you. How many of you want wisdom to keep you? <laughs> well, you're going to better love her. You better start falling into some love here. Because if you love her, she'll guard you and she'll keep you. What does the word keep you? She watch over you. The, this wisdom preserves you. It, it keeps you, it guards you from danger if you have the right wisdom walking with you. Now, just think that we can actually remove danger from our life by romancing wisdom. By just saying wisdom, I'm going to have wisdom in what I do. I'm going to walk in the wisdom of it. I'm going to walk in pre- the presence of God. I'm going to walk biblical terms. I'm going to walk in what God has called me to walk with wisdom. It actually guards you from danger. It keeps you, it, it, it keeps you um, what would you call it? It's like when, when you pickle something. It stays good for a long time, right? It preserves you. So you need to get pickled. You need to come to the changing part where wisdom holds you and keeps you and you don't move from it. So, the Holy Spirit likes pickling us, right? Why we pickle? Because it, cha- it doesn't change the form of it, change the context of it. Though it, cha- it you become renewed, right? Like, uh, I'm not Larry no more, now I'm a pickle. <laughs> like, you're not the cucumber no more, now you're, you, you know? So, it's also, it keeps a secret. It keeps that hidden factor of Christ Jesus when it's not necessary. It doesn't reveal the wrong thing. It, 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 keeps that, it doesn't reveal your sins or your mishaps or your faults. It actually keeps a secret. Wisdom puts you in the right order to walk in the right place at the right time. And I'm going to talk about it more and more. Verse 7 says this, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and with all your get getting, get understanding. Whew, that's a big word in King James there. Um, in the right beginning, verse 5, it says, um, get wisdom and get understanding. So get understanding is very important. Get understanding is a discernment. So getting wisdom is not enough. You need to have discernment in your wisdom. And so when we walk in the wisdom, oh, <laughs> praise God. And um, <laughs> Sorry about that. It just had to happen. Um, when you get... <laughs> When you get wisdom, you need understanding. You need to discernment how to operate in that. Everybody awake? Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> so how many of you need to know? So we go back to verse 7 now. Wisdom is a principal thing, which is, means wisdom is the beginning of everything you need to do. Uh, the word wisdom, I mean the principal thing actually means the beginning, the first fruits. It means to be the chief over your life. Wisdom has to be the chief in your life. The action of her has to be the chief of your life. It has to be the beginning of your life. Why? Without wisdom, you just make mistakes. Without wisdom, you just don't walk in there. Without, without loving wisdom. Without, you know, you, you should almost be addicted to wisdom. You should be addicted to wisdom. God's wisdom. You should be addicted. Oh God, I need your next, next direction. I need wisdom in how to do this. I need to wisdom how to make this deal. I need to make wisdom how to make this sale or this, that. You choose to walk in the wisdom and it becomes the beginning of every transaction you make. It becomes the beginning of every healing that you receive. It becomes the beginning of every force of process you take. You start using wisdom. It says, wisdom is a principle thing. Get wisdom and with all 
you're getting, means you're getting wisdom, all you're getting, you're getting lots of wisdom, get understanding. So if you're going to get wisdom, you need some understanding. You need some discernment in your wisdom. If you don't have discernment in your wisdom, your wisdom is just really sitting on a shelf. So you need to, when God shows you wisdom, because His wisdom, and I'm going to show you the New Testament, His wisdom is so complex because it's a mystery. And if you don't have discernment in the mystery, you're not going to reveal the mystery. So there's a wisdom that is released, which is God's mystery. It's, a, it's romance, guys. Romance is not revealed in public always. It is a, it's a very touchy subject, romance. Intimacy is a very touchy subject. And so same thing with the wisdom. It's a touchy subject that we need to walk in and with discernment so that we can react accordingly to the wisdom. You are getting that? Verse 8, amen? Anybody awake still? I should be preaching from the pulpit here. Sorry, I'll just go here again. Verse 8 says this. Well, we're not. I think, you know, I kind of look good the whole thing, right? So I just have to go in front of the pulpit every so often. Camera. No, just kidding. Anyway. We've got to loosen up. We've got to have fun in church, right? So you're okay if I'm just kind of being myself here? Okay, good. Verse 8 says this. Exalt her. And she shall promote you. Ho, ho, ho. Exalt her, and she shall promote you. So you need to exalt the wisdom within you. You need to exalt that very force of what God has telling you to do and how He's leading you. You have to exalt her. And then she will promote you. What does promote you mean? Promote is, in one way of saying it, is to rise up. That will rise you up in Christ Jesus. Promote you. So guess what? You're going to be seen by people. People are going to recognize you. Because wisdom promotes you. Wisdom is not something that you can hide. Something, that's something that's promoted. It is revealed in the deep level of intimacy. And it is promoted in the public. And so people see the wisdom. They see your action. They see you being successful. And they, you walk in that presence. So, it promotes you. And she shall bring you to honor. Wow. Wisdom will bring you to honor. You will gain honor by operating in wisdom. People will start honoring the... The enemy will even honor the name of Jesus within you and won't be able to come and attack you no more because there's honor now in the name of Jesus. That wisdom that you walk in, he cannot misuse it because you're walking in wisdom. I was thinking when I was, when I was, um, <laughs> hallelujah, um, when I was worshiping here, praise God, um, I'm getting this power source through me, so we'll see what that does. But um, I was sitting here and, and I was thinking about this fear I often have I say, okay, God, I know I have this anointing now that I just really explored just recently, not that long ago, um, and it scares people, and some people maybe get um, mad because the noise is so loud and headaches come and stuff like that. And if all that happens, we'll pray for your healing right after. But, um, but when we come into that place, I was fearful, and, and, but you know what? It brings honor when you release the presence of God. It brings honor to do that. And it says... It shall bring honor. It means that you get recognized for the power. God allows you to use the power. When, okay, it says, she shall bring you honor when you do embrace her. When does honor come? When you embrace her. Give her a good hug. Get romantic. Make that part of your life. Make it a part of your deep level of your life is to walk in God's wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the beginning of every step you can take. Wisdom is that very source that will operate through you. And wisdom will... I need wisdom even to work in the supernatural. I need wisdom to do every step I take. I need wisdom. I can't just be a, uh, a loose person. I'm loose here because I tell you ahead of time I'm going to be loose. But I mean overall is that I still try to use wisdom in everything we do, right? So wisdom is a huge thing. So do embrace her, and he will, she will give you honor, and she will promote you when you embrace her. Verse 9, she shall give... Now what time did I start? Okay. Um, does anybody have a time on them? Take it off and just put it away. So you don't look at it. <laughs> just kidding. That was not my own idea. I saw that many years ago. Everybody said, well, who has the time? Everybody goes, oh, here, take it off and put it in your pockets right now. <laughs> don't look at it no more. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't look at your time, you won't notice the time, I guarantee it. <laughs> you know? Did you know most revivals and most things happen in hours, not in minutes? 
Really, if you think about it, I studied revival a lot because I'm, I'm a revivalist, in my opinion. Uh, in my opinion, I love the power and I love to see healing. I studied revivalists. I have never seen a revival meeting that goes under five hours yet. And we don't even do it in five hours, we do it three hours. But I'm just saying, well, I don't know if we do three hours, whatever we do. We try to do an hour and a half and then we try to pray for another hour or two. But either way, the revival, the power of the Holy Spirit doesn't come in 30 minutes always. It comes in the, in the hunger. It comes in the, in the, whoa, I want this. It's Wednesday night, kids are going to school tomorrow, but I don't care, I want this. It's why I got to work at five in the morning. I don't care, I want, that's what revival does. Revival is hunger. And when hunger is there, the pastor just has to continue preaching because they're getting pulled. Because they want to hear more and the power goes. And there's a few that could fall asleep and go home. That's okay. If you need to go early, then you need to go early. But you know what? Real strength comes in the time of hunger. It comes in the time that we spend with God as a church. I'm going to share about this. This is a really cool message if you stick with this. And if you get excited with me, it's really good. And verse 9 says, She shall give you your head an ornament of grace. Wow. <laughs> See, my wisdom is going to crown me. Yes, you. It says he's going to give you, your head, an ornament of grace. Meaning that it's going to go on you, not on the wisdom. It's going on you. Be careful with that. It's really good stuff. What does grace mean? He's going to crown you. He's going to put an ornament of grace, which means he's going to put favor, charm on you. How I many you want some charm? <laughs> and acceptance on you. So we walk in this place, because we all need charm, because charm gets us a long way, doesn't it? Now, if it's misused, it gets you in the wrong way, in a long way, different way. But if you use it rightfully, charm can get you into the process of many things, right? If you have to choose to walk in charm, we have to choose to be charmful. Because if we're not charmful, nobody's going to listen to us, right? We have to have some charm in life. And this is what this wisdom does. When you have wisdom, it also people respect it. They see you as a, as, a, as a person of respect. They see you as a person that they can trust. They see you as somebody that, because they see your ducks in a row if you want to call it that or see you in that row they see you in a place where you can walk forward in wisdom wisdom is the principal thing and it's a place that we need to engage into as a her as a she or a he you need to engage into her you need to make it a part of your life you can't call it an it no more you have to call it a process of life now you have to call it the presence of the identity of Christ Jesus uh, and the identity of God you have to start taking wisdom as a her and so here we go. And the crown, and also a crown of glory shall be delivered to you. Uh, no, sorry, a crown of glory shall she deliver to you. <laughs> oh, glory! How many you want to see gold dust and you want to see glory? You just want to see the fullness of Jesus Christ. You want to see whoo, everything. Like that's what it does. See, the thing is, being foolish doesn't bring us to glory. Being wise brings us to glory. Obeying the word of God, walking in his presence and following his footsteps and walking in his path, that's what brings the glory. That's what brings the revival. That brings the anointing. That brings us to the glory. Now we can walk into that place and the wisdom will bring us glory. Not our glory. He's going to bring glory so we can operate in glory. It's strength. Isn't that good? It's time to be wise, guys. And gals, let's be wise. Let's, let's put some charm on. Let's put some grace on. Let's, because grace, when, when that is put on our head, and when that ornament is put onto us, it is full of favor. How many want God's favor today? Well, we need to walk in wisdom to have favor. Everything connects. It's a beginning thing. So praise God. You're getting it. I don't want to bore you. So let's go to verse 10. 10. Hear, O my son, receive my sayings. And the years of your life shall be many. Why shall there be many? Because God can actually use you for something now. Well, just read it. Hear, oh my son, and receive my sayings. He, what was he saying? He was saying, get wisdom. Make it the principal thing. Make that your romancer. Make it the embracer. Fall in love with Wisdom. And it says, Here, O oh my son, receive my sayings. The years of your life shall be many. Why shall it be many? Because you just heard that you should follow wisdom and you're going to take action on wisdom. Because when you walk in God's wisdom, you are in control. And God is in control of your life now. Because now you have, there's a reason to live many years. How many of you are dead here? 
Okay, none of you. No, physically, right? You're not physically dead here, right? And if you're not physically dead, it means you have a great purpose in your life ahead of you yet. Because in the Bible, you look at the Bible, if Jesus had done with somebody, they, they died. Nothing wrong with dying, but when, when your life is done, you're, you're dying. Or you're dead. The fact is you're not dead because God has a purpose for you. The fact is there's healing for you. The fact is that the very essence of wisdom is entering into you. The fact is that God wants many more lives in you to follow. He's revealing, saying that, look, you're here today. There's a purpose you're here today. There's a purpose you're here at outflowing service at Leko Leko Amis. There's a purpose of this. It's because there's many things to come. You are important to God. That's why you're here today. That's why you're alive today, because there's an importance in your life that needs to be released. God knows what He's doing. Every one of us has a great purpose ahead of us yet. We're still breathing. We have purpose. Verse 11. I have taught you in the, in the way of wisdom. I have led you into the right paths. Oh, I love that word, paths. Now he's taught you in wisdom. Now you're walking in wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. What does this word paths mean? It's entrenchment. It's a place of track. It's a... Just, I'm a hunter, somewhat. I pretend, anyway. I haven't got a deer since I moved to Manitoba, but I still pretend to be a hunter every year. Go out there with my gun and start hearing God and forget about shooting a deer. <laughs> but it's still all good. <laughs> Have you ever done that? No, I, no, maybe not. But I was hunting one time, and I think somebody in this room probably is praying that I shouldn't get a deer. <laughs> but either way, that's all good. We all have prayers that need to be answered. And when I was sitting in my vehicle that one time, and I put this audio book on because I don't read very well, I read, but I don't read. I wasn't driving, I was sitting with my vehicle warming, with my gun ready, and I had this earpiece on and listened to this book, and I just got soaked into it. And I, wow, hallelujah. I look up and I saw a tail of a deer. I missed it. <laughs> just telling you how confusing you can get when you're hearing. Like. So, so there is a purpose behind it, but through that hunting season, I definitely got 15 messages out of it. Uh, I heard God because I was out of my own norm. I, my cell phone wouldn't work half the time, so I couldn't talk to nobody. And so, it's just the way it is. You hear God when you're, 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 you're taking the time to listen. But this is what paths do. I'm a hunter. I was going to talk about paths, but, you know, when I walk into the wilderness, and if I don't walk on a path, guess what happens? You can't find your way back very easy if you don't have a compass or anything like that. Because there's no path. This is what wisdom does. It creates a trenchment, a path. It actually gives you a clear path that you cannot get lost on. It actually moves into your, it actually stomples ahead of you, and it's actually entrenched a path for you. So now you are walking on your purpose in your life because you're following wisdom. What happens if you don't follow wisdom? The path is not there no more. And what happens when you don't have a path in life? You just go in circles. You see the same tree over and over again. You think it's the same tree, anyway. You know? You have no idea where you are. But anyway, you walk in this path, an entrenchment. It means it's, it's even to the point where it's a circular path where your life has a circuit to fulfill. It has a purpose to fulfill. It's like a racetrack. And if you see the racetrack, you get to the finish line if you follow the path. So now this path is an entrenchment of your life. That's what wisdom will bring you. It will bring you a path. And I understand paths quite well. How many want to hear a story about a path? Yeah, I love stories. I was hunting... We actually used to get deers in Alberta. I actually shot one every year. And uh, my, then in those days, I didn't listen to audiobooks. So maybe that's the purpose. I don't know. Maybe that was the reason I got deers. But either way, I was driving in this path, and you're going to the coulee, right? That's what they call in Alberta. Coulees or belly. And uh, I was driving there, and it was so entrenched that I was driving this way, and I found out there was somebody coming, or I couldn't go that way. And I tried to get out of the path. I couldn't get out of it. Have you ever tried driving a path and you're steering and this thing just won't get out of the ruts? That's the kind of entrenchment this is, that God keeps you on the track if you're in wisdom. And so what I did with this path, I had to back all the way out of the path. I learned how to drive backwards that day. But you drive, actually I didn't have to try hard because it kept me in the path. Like, I didn't go off track. <laughs> but you know what? It's the most, but the only thing is too, is that the enemy can bring this entrenchment to your life too. And if you don't have wisdom, you're going to have the wrong path in your life. 
And what happens now if I can't get out of my path when I'm in the wrong path? The only way I can do it is by getting help and getting towed out of it. I need a tow truck. I need you to help me pull it out of it. Or you need somebody to help you pull it out of it. So the only way I could get out is by somebody pulling on it and just pulling me out of there because I can't get out of an entrenchment myself. I built myself a, a pattern, a root in my life that I kept replaying it, and I can't get out of this replay. Have you ever been there? We are there sometimes. It's, a, it's called inner healing. It's called a pain that you can't get rid of. And you're just walking over and over and say, I can't get out of this rut in my life. That's where you need to be pulled out. And then we try one little thing. You know what? A Toyota can't pull out a Toyota. You need the big guns. Like I had this little S10, and, and you try to pull it out with a little dots, and it just don't work. You need the right people. You need the right source to pull you out of this place. And so when wisdom does it, it creates the right path for you. So how many of you want to walk in the right path? Verse 12 says this. When you go, your steps shall not be straightened, which means distressed. It shall not be distressed. And when you run, you shall not stumble. Oh, man, hallelujah. Like, I know what that feels like, stumbling and running. When, you, when this takes your steps, when you run, you should not stumble. There's one time I was thinking that I could run really fast. And I was starting to run, and my mind was running, my feet stopped, and you fall forward. I've done that, like, just not that long ago. And, and I, I was going, I can't stop! And you fall down, you stumble, because, because the very essence of, of a stumbling block in your mind, or in somewhere there's a stumbling block. Now, that's the worst experience you can ever have. When you run as fast as you can, and you're trying to beat your kids, and your legs stop, and your mind keeps going. Your mind thinks you're running, your legs have no clue that they were still running. But when this is the whole idea is that when we have wisdom, we don't stumble. We can run the race and we can win the race. When we walk in the wisdom power of God and we walk and make it the principal thing in our life, we become successful in who we are. Now, he's full of instructions here. Take fast hold of instruction. Let, your, let her not, let her not go. Sorry, I'm not trying to get this right here. Let her not go. Hold fast to the wisdom's instruction. You have to hold fast. What does instruction mean? Discipline yourself to what wisdom says. Discipline yourself to have romance with wisdom. Discipline yourself to be engaged to wisdom. Discipline yourself to be engaged to the people that you need to be engaged to. The thing is the wisdom has instructions. It says, do not let her go. Keep her. She will. I mean, for she is your life. That's what the scripture says. Because it's the very source of your life, is God's wisdom. Well, let's just look at Luke. I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures. That was my main text today. Hopefully I can get you through these scriptures a little fast here for you, just so you don't have to sit too long. Are you everybody okay still? Yeah, we're okay, yeah. Because wisdom is the principal thing, and I think we often forget about wisdom. I think we forget about doing things right. I think we forget about asking God first before we do something sometimes, and we just kind of go off and start skipping away and, and find out we skipped the wrong way. Luke 2, 49 to um, 52. Now here was Jesus, the first time that he went out. He, and um, he was 12 years old here. And um, I can just imagine as a parent how this would feel. But before verse 49, Jesus was in the synagogue talking. And the parents left without their child. Because they thought they were in the company of the family. In that culture, everybody took care of each other. So if they were with acquaintances or if they were with different family members... Well, you're probably just spending a day with them. That's okay. Now, today's culture, if we had a day with our kid not knowing where they were, we would probably go crazy. So a day went past, and they also found out Jesus was missing. They traveled the whole day on foot. and Je You know, that's just like going for a whole day to Alberta, and then finally you have to drive 14 hours back to come and get your kid. <laughs> Let's put it today's technology. Like That's like a whole day walking, that's probably about 12 to 14 hours, I'm guessing. And maybe their days were longer like some farmers are, and they go 18 hours. Who knows? But then you have to drive. Let's say if you drove that long, and then you had to come back to get your kid, what would that do to you? Oh, boy. Wouldn't that be like panic mode? Let's run. But I'm tired. I can't. I just walked 12 hours. How the... By the way, just think about it. So then it goes on, and Jesus was talking to the Son of God, and verse 49 says this. And he said to them, 
sorry, he says, and he said to them, how is it that you sought me? Like, Jesus said, like, why? Why are you looking for me? At the young 12-year-old kid saying that to a parent. Now, what about my 12-year-old? If you had a 12-year-old and you say, where have you been? Like, like, why are you asking? What would we do? We'd probably ground them. And then this is Jesus said, knew you not that I must be about my father's business? Then he goes to verse 50 and says this, verse 50 says, and they understood not the saying which he spoke to them. The parents didn't understand Jesus. But verse 51, it says, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these sayings in heart. What Jesus spoke, the mother kept in his heart because the mother knew there was something special about Jesus. But verse 52 says this, and Jesus increased in wisdom and structure, and in the favor, which means grace, and the grace with God and men. See, when you walk in obedience, when you walk in wisdom, you increase in wisdom, you increase in grace, you increase in favor of God, and you increase, in, with, in this case, Jesus increased with God and man. Jesus became known to man because of his wisdom and because of his structure that he put forth and because he walked forth in the promises of God. See, the thing is, Jesus, why was Jesus on earth? To live an example for us, right? I believe that. And to die for us and all that. And to, to, to raise again. But he did it so he could. So I believe this scripture can be taken this. If you, if you follow wisdom and you increase in Jesus, wisdom and structure will follow you everywhere you go. Wisdom will increase in you. And your favor and your grace with man and God will increase. How many of you want favor in men's hearts? Why you want favor is because you need to save men and you need to save women. You need to bring them to the fullness of healing. That's why we need favor. Christianity today has very little favor sometimes in the world, right? We need to change that. We need to walk in wisdom into the world. We need to use wisdom and not scare people off, but we need to gain favor in the world and not scare them off. So with wisdom, it, it will increase that place. Isn't that cool? That's amazing, I think. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 8. However, we speak wisdom among that, them that are perfect, yet not wisdom in the world, nor the princes of this world that, are come, that come to nothing. But we speak wisdom to, of God in mystery. Listen to that carefully. But we speak the wisdom of God in mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world to our glory. We have to start embracing wisdom because it's a mystery to be revealed. Here I wrote down in my little note here, just the little notes I do take, I put a note here. Romance, wisdom to find the mystery. See, the thing is, it says right here, it says, speak wisdom. It's a, like it's a mystery. And it's hidden wisdom. And it's ordained to His glory. So let's walk in his glory. Let's gain his wisdom in that presence of what we need to do that. It says, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord to glory. So we know that this world hasn't much wisdom when it comes to Christ Jesus. We know that um, we can walk in this place and we understand that wisdom is a mystery to the Christians. And the only way you'll find wisdom in your life is to get intimate with Christ. Intimate with power. Intimate with the Holy Spirit. Can we turn that fan on, Corey? And so, let's walk into that wisdom knowing that. And you know what? I, when I look at this scripture, I almost need to thank God that He didn't give people wisdom like that. Because He wouldn't have died for our sins then, would He? I thank God that He's the one that has the wisdom. I thank God that we have access to that wisdom, that mystery of God. I thank God for that because if these people had the wisdom and, and didn't crucify God, the Lord for our sins, what would have happened? I don't want to go there because it didn't happen. Jesus did get crucified and rose again. But you just have to think. Jesus knew. God knew what he was doing. He implanted and he made wisdom a mystery so that we can go there as need and seek God for it so that our life can be successful in Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Amen? Ephesians 3, um, 6, uh, 9 to 13. I'm just about done here, I think. Um, 
Verse 9 says, And to make all men to see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So if you don't think that Jesus Christ was here before the creation, well, that's one scripture that you could use. He created all things in Christ Jesus, okay? In verse 10 it says, To, to the tent, to the intent that now unto the principalities of powers and the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold grace of God. Why was it hidden? So it could be known to the church. So I kind of wrote this down. I haven't done this for a long time. If you want an argument what church is, I'm going to just settle that argument right now. Because I studied the word church again for you. It says this, we just remember this, to the intent to know that the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church, manifold wisdom of God. Yes, it says heavenly places. Have you been there yet? Let's get there. We can go there. We can enjoy heavenly places. Woo, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm just thinking about it right now. It's just like, whoo, it's right there. Praise God. Um, but what, it's, what, what is it... Uh, that places might be known by the church. That's why it was hidden. The mystery was hidden. Now, the church means this. A gathering of citizens called out from their homes. Not in their homes. They're called out of their homes. I'm talking from the dictionary here. The Greek, the Texas Receptus, from the Greek dictionary. This is what church means. A gathering of citizens called out of their homes into some public place and an assembly. In a Christian sense, assembly of Christians gathered for worship in the religious meeting. There goes religious. Again, we'll just call it pure religion, okay? A company of Christians or of those who hoping for eternal salvation through Christ Jesus, through Jesus Christ, to observe their own religious rights, to uh, hold their own religious meetings, and to manage their own affairs according to the regulations prescribed by the bodies in order's sake. So this church is this. It is a place where we get together out of our homes for what? Exactly what I said in the beginning. So the power can join together. So we can worship together. So we can see the fullness together. So we can feel the presence together. That's what it's for. And when we walk in that, understanding that church is not... I've studied church over and over again. I don't see it as a home church. It might start there. I don't see it as that. It, it does say in the scripture that you should go to church and then you should go house to house and have communion. It does say that. So fellowship is very important. So the small groups are very important. And your friendship rounds are very important. You need that. But you need to get out of your house. Why? Because it's a familiar place. What happens in familiar places? You shut down. A home is a refuge, right? When a home is a refuge, what are you doing? I'm sitting on my chair. I'm not thinking about ministry. I'm reclining back with my remote. It's, you get out of that chair. You get out of your familiarity and you go and join with the body of Christ and you worship. Then once you finish worship, then you go and, and kind of put your, put your um, chairs up together and sit together and put your feet up. You start communicating, you start fellowshipping. The presence of God, this mystery is known, is, will be known today. Why? Because we're joining in belief today. We're seeing the miracles today. According to the eternal purpose which He purposed, in Christ Jesus the Lord, in whom we have boldness and access and with confidence by faith of Him. Therefore, I desire that we faint not that at my tribulations for you, which are your glory. Your tribulations are your glory. Did you know that? Now, I'm not talking sicknesses of God here. You have to understand my sayings here. That I'm, I'm not saying that at all, sickness of God. But your tribulations is for God's glory. Why do trials come your way? Anybody know why trials come your way? Don't answer that. I'll answer it for you. And we can discuss that. But the trials in life come to you one way. It's because of this. How many, first of all, would just say that, you know what, I have sometimes too many trials. We all would say that, right? We all have troubles and circumstances that we just like to be out of. So what do we do? We run from them, right? We have the wrong race. Because they, you know what, if you run from your trial, they always run after you. Trials are there for you to win them. Why? Because we're here on this earth to win the enemy. And the enemy comes against you, and if you run away from your trials, there's no glory in that because the glory is in victory. So when you have trials in your life, it's not from God. Don't get me wrong. It's absolutely not from God. But it's there for you to win. 
It's not there for you to run away. It's there to your face forefront and get the army of God together, the church together, and say, I'm going to win this trial. And when you win that trial, that's where the glory is. It builds the glory in your trial. So you have to know that the only reason I have persecution is because it, that's, that's what I'm here for. If I don't have persecution, I'm not in the fight against no more. Like, I ha- I'm here to win. We are here as a church to win the enemy. And if we're going to try to win the enemy without him coming against you, he's just not going to go nowhere. Trials will come, and the only way you can win the enemy is if the trials come at you and you're ready to fight them. The enemy plan gets shrunk. Oh! <laughs> Let's get the power going. And the last verse I'm saying today. Two scriptures here. Uh, Colossians 4, 5 to 6. Now this, this is a closing scripture. But I hope you get the idea of wisdom, how important that is. And with understanding and discernment that we need with it. Walk in... Oops, I, sorry, I did something there. I shouldn't have waked the baby up. Oh, sorry, here we go. Um, uh, Colossians 4, uh, 5, 6 to, uh, uh, 5 and 6. It says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. So you need to walk in wisdom with them that are without. Why? Because they need some time redeemed. We need to get out there and we need to redeem the time of souls. Because those souls are wasted or, or they are sick or whatever it may be. We need to come in there with wisdom and help them into wisdom so they can be healed and been born again so they can come to Jesus. So we need to go in wisdom toward them that have without redeeming the time. Meaning that God is in short, short coming now. He says, I, I want you to hurry up and get some people into the church. I want you, you to get ready for, the, for revival. I want you to go out there and redeem the time. Verse 6 says this, And let your speech always with, sorry, let your speech oh, uh, be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. See, the thing is, now we are going to this earth, and we get this wisdom. What is our wisdom for? It's to win the world. It's to win our trials. It's there to win the circumstances. Uh, every time you go out, there will be a trial. And so, don't think, saying, God, I don't want no more trials, because you know what? That's not going to happen. You just you have to fight these trials. You've got to win these trials. And I'm going to fight them with you, and we're going to win them. One at a time, we're going to win, and we're going to see victory every time, okay? And when we see victory, what happens? We, get, we, get, we, get, we become warriors. Uh, James 1, 2 to 4. We become patient, we become faithful, and we become equipped. And so we need to walk in this, knowing this. Is that we have to get out there, and we've got to season our tongue a little bit. There's a lot of grace, a lot of favor there. Now salt it up a little bit. What does that mean? Put some spice on your speech. Talk a little bit. Love a little bit more. Hold. You gotta put some, you know, it's like, it's like putting salt on a steak. If you don't have the right seasoning and the right salt on a steak, it just doesn't taste good. So when people come to you and if you don't have your, your speech seasoned, your grace seasoned with salt, what happens? They don't like the taste. So we don't have wisdom. When we don't use wisdom, if we're trying to redeem the time with wisdom, and we're bringing wisdom, and say we use wisdom, we speak clearly, and we speak with the love of Jesus Christ. Today, that's my message there, but today we're going to do this.